Hi, uh, good uh, afternoon everyone and welcome to CAFC's webinar series, CAFC Presents. My name is Lisa Stromquist and I'm the coordinator for quality and patient safety here at the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And we normally have these presentations every Wednesday to showcase um, to showcase uh, something exciting from one of our partner or member organizations. But in recognition of World Sepsis Day, we've uh, scheduled this special event on, on Friday, September 13th. And uh, before we get started with today's presentation, I just want to provide everyone with a bit of the, the technical details. And all the lines have come in muted so that there's no background noise to distract our presenter. And uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, you should notice a, a question box uh, in a control panel. So as the presentation unfolds, uh, feel free to write down any of the questions uh, that you might have as they occur to you. And uh, we'll answer these uh, at the end of the presentation during the designated question and answer session. During the presentation, we're also going to have some questions for the audience. So we'll have some multiple choice poll questions. And we're also going to have some sort of more open-ended thought questions for, uh, for you. And during uh, those times, I'll give you instructions at that time on how to uh, handle those. I'm sure you'll be, it'll be obvious to everybody. Um, like all of our presentations, this one's being recorded and it will be posted to CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network. So you can see the Knowledge Exchange Network here. And um, uh, I would really encourage you to take a look at some of our past presentations um, uh, that we have up there. Uh, a very uh, uh, wide variety of things from FASD, childhood development and rehabilitation, decision support, childhood pain, mental health, transitions, and uh, many others. So really I encourage you to visit the can and view those past sessions. Now about today, so CAFSI learned about uh, this initiative of the uh, uh, World Sepsis Day, uh, an initiative of the, of the Global Sepsis Alliance through our um, uh, it's a community of practice in sepsis. And I'm just going to flip over to the World Sepsis Day um, uh, website. And um, so the CAFC board has signed the World Sepsis Day declaration and endorses the goals of uh, the, the uh, Global Sepsis Alliance. So today we're going to focus on sepsis in the vulnerable population, a vulnerable pediatric population, from a global and a Canadian perspective. And we welcome uh, Dr. Graham Thompson. He's an academic pediatric emergency medicine specialist, and uh, with uh, he does clinical research. And he is an attending physician as well at the pediatric emergency in pediatric emergency medicine at Alberta Children's Hospital. So I'm going to turn the the uh, podium over uh, to uh, Dr. Thompson and, uh, and we'll get this presentation started. Excellent, thank you very much. So um, can everybody see the screen there hopefully? Uh, as I uh, was mentioned, I'm Graham Thompson. I work at the Alberta Children's Hospital Pediatric Emergency Department and have been here for about 10 years and uh, find it's a fantastic place for uh, both clinical and research and educational perspectives and I got involved in sepsis um, related to a few uh, cases that were happening in our, our region in the 2006-2007 uh, era. So this was uh, a case that I briefly put up here that's related to, um, to sepsis and uh, is, is one that's quite well known here in Alberta. It's the story of a four-year-old boy who had some abdominal pain and was brought to the emergency department at that point, he didn't seem too sick to the triage nurses and was triaged as a, a level three or uh, urgent uh, care required and was sent to the waiting room. After a few hours, uh, the family left the emergency department and found that they could manage the child at home. Unfortunately, less than a day later, he was back in the emergency department with a ruptured appendix and uh, from that experience, he developed sepsis. Unfortunately, uh, his outcome was not uh, uh, great, and uh, he did have some time in the ICU, after which he had a cardiac arrest and unfortunately died. So today what we're going to talk about very briefly is going over the definition and epidemiology of sepsis. We'll take a quick look at some of the Canadian administrative data that we have regarding sepsis. 
very briefly, not to go over a lot of the science, but just looking at what does work uh, in managing sepsis and then looking at the global effort to stop sepsis and save lives. Finally, what we'll do is take a quick peek at what's currently happening in the Canadian pediatric hospitals and what physicians would like to help them in the management of sepsis. And then and I'd like to chat very briefly about what our next steps are. So before going too much further, I just have to make sure that I make a disclaimer. I am an emergency physician, and so most of what I talk about is going to be coming from the emergency perspective, although a lot of this can be translated into other areas of pediatric care. And though I have no financial conflicts and do not own shares in Lego, I really enjoy playing with Lego with my children. So what is sepsis? Sepsis is basically the systemic reaction to infection. And there's a large continuum uh, in the sepsis uh, network. First of all, starting off with systemic inflammatory response syndrome, and then progressively going through to sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. Why do we need to talk about this? Globally, someone dies of sepsis every three to four seconds. These are statistics that we have seen many times, but it's good to review, particularly those applying to children. Approximately 60 newborn, 6 million newborns and children die annually. And in some places around the world, 60 to 80% of deaths are actually related to sepsis. How about more local to us and our experience? There's definitely been an increase in the last decade in expenditures related to sepsis. Initially in 2000, there was an estimated $2 billion of expenditures related to sepsis hospitalizations, and that has climbed to almost $15 billion in 2008. Interestingly, in the, in the whole population, uh, not just children, but uh, sepsis admissions surpass heart attack admissions in most general hospitals across North America. In pediatrics, it has now become the second highest cause of death in children zero or one to 14 years of age. The only thing that surpasses that is traumatic injury. And this is a, a graphic that's been designed by the World Sepsis Team. And uh, I found it very interesting. It shows how many uh, cases per 100,000 population in the developed world are related to sepsis compared to stroke, cancer, heart, and HIV disease. And then relates that to the amount of uh, funding that has been uh, established across the U.S. As you can see, there is uh, almost an inverse relationship with the number of cases of sepsis and the actual funding per case that has been uh, established. How about more locally? Let's take a look a little bit closer to home. There was a study that was published in 2010 by HUSAC that looked at the uh, state of sepsis in Canadian hospitals. This picture uh, took a look at um, CHI-HI data from 2004 to 2008, and they used the DADS and NACRS uh, database, which is part of the, um, uh, the CHI-HI data uh, repository. And just to, before I go on, I should mention that this data does not include Quebec hospitals because of reporting differences. Overall, there were greater than 30,000 hospital admissions that were reported in this uh, study. What you'll notice is that, um, in general, uh, for sepsis and non-severe sepsis, there was no real change in hospitalization rates. However, the rate of severe sepsis hospitalizations increased by 17%. Almost 80% of these hospitalizations came through the emergency department. These two, uh, these two tables will show you a little bit more detail uh, related to the hospitalizations, particularly table four shows uh, the length of stay. So as you can see, the median length of stay for all sepsis was 12 days compared to all other hospitalizations excluding sepsis, which was three days. Taking a look at ICU care, all sepsis median length of stay was 45, um, was 6.3 days compared to 2.3 days. That was uh, a very good look at the chi height data that was done by HUSAC. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, did not separate age groups. And as we are looking at the um, CAPSI group here, um, 
we'd like to look at some pediatric data. So several uh, months after the publication, I asked um, uh, Dr. Husak to give me um, yeah, a subset of data of the pediatric population, and uh, she was very kind to do so. So the next several slides are looking at uh, children aged 0 to 17 years of age, again, that were admitted to hospital in Canada except for Quebec because of the uh, reporting differences. And this is from the years 2004 to 2009. As you can see from this table, the vast majority of children who are admitted uh, for sepsis were neonates. And the definition of neonate in this case was children that had not left hospital. Those uh, young newborns that had left the hospital were included in the zero to two month age category. This graph shows uh, the overall sepsis hospitalization rates based on age groups, including neonates, uh, the newborn population, the toddlers, the preschoolers, uh, the school age children, and the teenagers. The black bars, as you can see, demonstrate uh, the, the um, percentage of hospitalizations uh, related to sepsis uh, based on uh, age group. From this, you can obviously tell that there's significantly more newborns that were uh, admitted, and as the children got older, they were less likely uh, to be representative in the overall uh, uh, group of children admitted for sepsis. However, you will also notice the gray bars show that um, the severity of illness actually increases with age. So teenagers had an overall higher representation of severe sepsis than those children that were younger. Overall, across the five years, the hospitalization rate for total sepsis and non-severe sepsis uh, decreased during the time of the study. However, severe sepsis stayed constant. Looking at the mortality, the total sepsis and non-severe sepsis cohort did not change over the five years. However, it looks like we are uh, improving care for those children who have severe sepsis as the rate of uh, mortality decreased over time. We then subgrouped the mortality according to age group. And um, uh, what you will see from uh, this graph story, there are multiple lines here. It shows that overall, um, the majority of age groups did not have a change in crude mortality over the five years. There were two groups, however, that actually did have a change. And those were children in this three to 23 month range and in the teenagers. We're not exactly sure if we have a great explanation for this. One of the things we have been considering is whether or not this is related to the introduction of Prevnar and Mengegate, uh, who target uh, these age groups. In those children who have um, sepsis and organ failure associated with severe sepsis, uh, you will notice that the most common organ uh, involvement is respiratory. This is often the reason for ICU admission in children. You will notice that the low incidence and high mortality rate in those children with hepatic disease and central nervous system disease is quite startling. One of the uh, possible explanations for this is the new research that shows there is a neuronal control of um, uh, infection fighting cells in the liver and people with uh, acute brain injury have uh, reduced immune function. This may be associated with what we're seeing in the mortality rate of those children that have hepatic or central nervous system. Here's some data for um, hospital metrics related to length of stay for administrators. Looking at all sepsis, the median length of stay in the days was 12, where for severe sepsis it was 61 days. That's over two months of a hospital stay for a severe sepsis episode uh, for Canadian children. For the ICU cohort, uh, the median length of stay was 11 days and 29 days for the severe sepsis population. While those data are really good to see for a baseline, there's some other important data that we need to look at. Back in 1963, the mortality from sepsis in children was 97%. In 2000, it had dropped down to 9%. This is fantastic. As an eMERGE doc, I'm, I'm really excited to see this. I do a lot of work with the adult eMERGE population and uh, the mortality rates that they quote is 30 to 40%.
as pediatricians and people taking care of, of children, we are doing a very, very good job. Uh, just a reminder, these statistics of this drop in mortality is related to the develop, developed world and uh, not um, those countries in the developing world. Perhaps the mortality rate is related to the lower, comorbid, the lower incidence of comorbid conditions in children and maybe the overall resilience of the children as well. A little bit more anecdotal evidence. Um, since the introduction of Prevnar in Calgary, the rate of strep pneumobacteremia has decreased significantly. Uh, and then, as I mentioned anecdotally, I'm uh, a young enough physician that started my uh, career in pediatric emergency medicine on staff 10 years ago, and I have never, ever seen Haemophilus influenza type B of any kind. So, um, uh, a good shout out to those people who uh, have helped us out with immunizations. The vaccines have made a significant difference to uh, sepsis in today's children. In terms of acute care, what actually makes a difference? Well, we know early recognition, early vascular access, early aggressive fluid resuscitation, early antibiotics, and early escalation of care are vital to improving the outcomes of children with sepsis. Finally, the implementation of sepsis bundles and pathways is vital uh, to make sure that um, children across the country uh, get standard, a good standard of care. While early recognition is really important, there are significant barriers to recognition of a septic child. Sometimes um, children have nonspecific presentations when they're in the early phases of sepsis and can look like they have other disease processes. There is the overuse of words like lethargic and irritable by parents. I would estimate uh, anecdotally that 70% of parents who bring their child in for fever say to me that their child is lethargic and they are running around the room. I think the definition of lethargic between a parent and who is not in healthcare and someone who is in healthcare is vastly different. So at times when parents say that their child is lethargic or irritable, uh, that can, um, with overuse, that can be ignored by healthcare professionals. And sometimes children who really are truly lethargic or irritable um, may be septic. The importance of age-adjusted vital signs uh, uh, is shown over and over again in the pediatric community. Uh, those people who are not used to seeing pediatric vital signs may not be able to recognize a child who is in trouble. Those of us who work with children frequently uh, are quite used to the uh, changes in vital signs according to age. However, uh, we know that more than 80% of the population who seek care in an emergency department across the country are seen in non-tertiary care emergency departments. Some of these staff may not be um, quite as familiar with age-adjusted vital signs. Along those lines, the heart rate and respiratory rate often are influenced by fever, by crying, by fear, by many other experiences uh, in the emergency department. And uh, it is not infrequent that I see a high heart rate for a specific age that uh, has been dismissed because of uh, a fever or because of fear. Another barrier is frequent mimickers. Uh, many times we rely on signs like altered vital signs. Uh, however, if you uh, see a child in bronchiolitis season, the majority of those children will have changes to their heart rate, to their respiratory rate, to their oxygen saturation, uh, and would meet criteria for systemic inflammatory response syndrome. However, it is impossible to screen or uh, go down a sepsis pathway for all these bronchiolytic children. It would completely overburden the emergency department and other healthcare settings. Finally, the ability of children to compensate uh, and uh, maintain a good cardiac output uh, by increasing their heart rate vast uh, outperforms the adult compensation in uh, sepsis presentations. Because of that, uh, children are sometimes not recognized. In order to help us, there are some blood tests that are available, including um, uh, lactates and procalcitonins. However, all tests have drawbacks, and in particular, there are very few tests that have point-of-care availability, 
uh, and can give you the answer at the at the time that you need it uh, at the child's bedside. This leads to delays um, when when we're ordering some of these tests. The other uh, barrier is that oftentimes tests are not available at all sites. So the question I have to the audience, uh, for those of you that work clinically, question number one is, are you able to obtain a procalcitonin level in your clinical setting? This is uh, my, my, I expect this to be quite variable across the country. So if you could uh, put in your answers there with Lisa, that would be fantastic. Yeah, so everybody just click on. I see everybody's uh, has figured out what to do. Just click on your answer. We'll give it a, a few moments, and um, uh, the more the more people that actually participate in the polls, it's it's uh, it's good to get a uh, a nice cross cutting uh, view of what's happening. So I'm going to close it now, and I'm going to share the results with you. So are you able to obtain a uh, procalcitonin level in your clinical setting? 8% said yes, 15% said no, and 77% it's unknown. So Excellent. Maybe, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Go ahead. I've hidden that now. Okay. So um, one of the things that does um, come up is the use of screening tools uh, in many settings. Again, I'm an emergency physician, so I'll be relating this to what we see in the emergency department. But screening tools are often useful to be able to uh, identify children. As you said, one of the biggest important um, components of sepsis management is identification. Um, there have been several studies looking at uh, the utility of screening tools. This one was done in, uh, down in Texas by uh, the Texas Children's Hospital group. And basically what they did was include um, this table here in every child that was seen in their triage department was um, uh, had to have these questions answered. Do you have any changes to the temperature? Do you have high risk conditions underlying your presentation? Is there a change to your pulse? Is there a change to your mental status? Uh, and do you look like you're in shock? This is another example of a sepsis screening tool that has been developed uh, here at the Alberta Children's Hospital. This is used by our nurses who fill out this uh, question and are asked to do it for at least every child that has um, a fever. So do they have signs of infection? Do they have vital sign changes? And is there any sign of organ dysfunction? If all three boxes are checked off, infection, inflammation, and uh, organ dysfunction, then those nurses can go ahead and start management, rapidly ident identify a physician to take care of that child and, and initiate our sepsis protocol. So question number two is, do you have a sepsis screening tool in your clinical setting? And if you do, what format is it in? Is it paper, electronic, or both? Oh, look at that. I was muted. I was talking oh, away, okay. and I was muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. I so was 50 trying to find out where you were. Okay. Yeah, 50 Sorry about that. Were, yeah, 50% were electronic, and 50% were both. Sorry. That's all right. Yeah. And how many people actually had a screening tool? Uh, only 8%. Here, I okay. can go back to the Yeah. Wow, so I talked all that time when I was muted. Oh, dear. All right. Well, we'll go on. Okay. Uh, if I can. Okay. So, yeah. um, the, while the use of screening tools may be uh, may help uh, in the emergency department and other settings, there are definitely barriers to using those tools. Um, the uh, CAPSI group uh, did send a survey to um, participants across the country, uh, asking them about the use of screening tools and potential barriers to their utilization in their clinical setting. Uh, as you can see here, there are many different barriers that were brought up. Some were cultural related to the site, some were individual barriers, some were related to the organization, and some were just related to the use of screening tools and clinical practice guidelines uh, overall. Um, 
one of the things that is often brought up in terms of the use of screening tools for sepsis, because it's related to uh, vital sign changes, is uh, the use of screening a screening tool in the winter during bronchiolitis season, where every single child will trigger the tool and ask uh, physicians to uh, en enroll this child in a sepsis pathway, which is probably inappropriate for those bronchiolytics that are doing quite well. So the next few slides, what I'll do is go through um, very briefly just some of the research that's out there that shows why we actually need to be uh, doing some of these uh, these methods that we know help in the management of sepsis. Not to get into the science, but basically just to let you know uh, it really does make a difference if we do some of these things. So this initial study was performed in 1991, uh, published in JAMA, which looks at the difference uh, in children with sepsis that had less than uh, 20 cc's per kilogram of fluids, those that had 20 to 40 cc's per kilo, and those that had greater than 40 cc's per kilo. So uh, not really a bolus, maybe a small bolus, and then a large bolus of fluid. And as you can see, the survival rate was much higher in those children that had um, a significant amount of fluid resuscitation uh, and uh, in the emergency department. This study looks at the use of early antibiotics, uh, and the graph on the left shows that uh, the black bars are showing that the longer it takes you to get antibiotics in, the uh, less your survival rate is. On the right, the graphic shows um, the odds ratio of death as it relates to the time from uh, uh, the onset of shock to uh, the administration of antibiotics. As you can see, your odds of death increases exponentially uh, the longer it takes to get antibiotics in. How about the use of formal pathways in the emergency department and other settings? This is a study that uh, looked at implementation of an overall protocol, so not just a screen, but an overall protocol uh, related to children uh, with sepsis. and. Um, and these are statistical process control charts. Uh, basically, for those of you who aren't used to statistical control charts on the right, uh, the initial phase, uh, the first half of the box looks pre-implementation of a protocol, and then uh, the second phase looks at what happens after the implementation of the protocol. So in the top box, we're looking at the number of children that received a good amount of fluid in the first hour, as you can see, there's a significant improvement after the implementation of the guideline. The number of children that, that had a lactate measure also significantly increased after implementation. And the number of children that received antibiotics within three hours uh, improved uh, and was more uh, stable uh, after the implementation as well. The criticism I would have here is that they should be within one hour, but that's uh, a small point. Another study looking at pathways in the emergency department shows a significant change to the uh, amount of time it takes to administer therapy. This is again a study done in Texas and uh, much improved uh, time to get a first <laughs> bolus of fluid, to get uh, more volume in, to get antibiotics in. That's greatly improved after the implementation uh, of a protocol. And another uh, statistic process control chart here shows you just how tight they were able to get the number of children getting their first bolus in. Um, they dropped the time dramatically. The time to having antibiotics was also improved significantly. This is an example of the pathway that we use at the Alberta Children's Hospital related to sepsis in the emergency department. We do have one as well for the ICU that is uh, separate from this. And this pathway, I think, is actually very similar. If those of you who are on the line are from BC, you'll recognize that uh, the two pathways are very similar. The next phase is escalation of care. I think this is a very important um, concept for, uh, for Canada. As I said previously, greater than 80% of children who receive emergency care receive that outside of the pediatric tertiary care centers. And uh, there needs to be a mechanism for getting children who require advanced care from their initial setting to, um, to do the higher levels of care. 
one of the initial papers looking at um, protocols and escalation of care is the early goal-directed therapy, and this was uh, published in, in the Journal of Medicine. And um, this is related to a very standard uh, practice in the emergency department, but it was performed by ICU staff. Now, this study is an adult study, uh, but I think the results can probably be extrapolated to children. Basically, if patients went through the protocol on the left, then their survival rate is significantly improved. And the, uh, the protocol was reviewed multiple times, as you can see by the graph on the right. And uh, the absolute reduction in mortality was immense. As you can tell, that graphic on the right shows that the smallest absolute reduction in mortality was around 10%, which is uh, unbelievable care. Does this apply to pediatrics? There have been studies that have looked at uh, escalating care and use of PALS guidelines, and uh, they definitely show that uh, there is an, an improvement in survival. 92% of those who received the guideline care uh, did survive compared to 62% who did not receive uh, guideline of care. And for each hour delay in uh, persistent shock and reversal of shock, you had a significant increase in mortality. So we know all these things are important. We know early recognition. We know early aggressive fluids. We know early antibiotics. We know early escalation of care. We know they are important and have an outcome difference. Are they actually happening? Well, not at all sites. This was a study that was done in 2009 looking at an experience across the United Kingdom. And as you can see by the slide, a significant number of children did not receive the care that was um, uh, that was suggested through the guide, international guidelines. And those children that did not receive the care had increased mortality as a result. The question then is, do we need to start implementing some of these, um, uh, some of these guidelines in, in a more rigorous manner? And, and how do we go about checking to see how our hospital is doing? So the next question I have is, does your set hospital or clinical setting have a quality assessment or improvement process for children with sepsis? So again, everybody, um, I made sure I was no longer muted. Just um, uh, make your, your choices here, and then we'll share the results uh, in just a moment or two. So through through our um, uh, our septus community of practice at CAFC, we've we've um, been asking these sorts of questions across the country um, over the last few months, and um, we'll see if uh, it sort of stays the same. I'm waiting for a few more people to to respond. We appreciate everybody participating in these polls because it gives us a clearer idea of what our audience is, uh, uh, where they are and what they're doing. And I'll share the results. So does your hospital clinical setting have a quality assessment improvement process for sepsis? 8% of you said yes, 58% said no, and 33% uh, said unknown. They're not sure whether you have this or not. Excellent, thank you. So part of the reason, um, part of the reason I went through um, those details, not to get bogged down in the science, um, but basically just to show that there are very well known um, uh, methodologies that we can implement in our healthcare settings that can uh, improve the the outcomes of our patients, and um, and it was surprising to me when I first started to get involved in sepsis care uh, how how few places actually did have some of these um, pathways and protocols and, and implementation of some of these guidelines that were in their department. And while individual uh, healthcare providers may know them to have it on an institutional basis, uh, can definitely increase. Um, uh, increase the usage of, of these uh, care plans and improve the outcomes of the children that they um, that we serve. Uh, so I think these are some of the things that we can 
uh, talk about as a community of practice and uh, go forward as administrators, as uh, healthcare providers, um, and going forward to, to see how we can improve the care of those children across Canada. So changing gears uh, a little bit, um, this was one of my favorite sepsis pictures that I have ever found. I'm going to go a little bit to World Sepsis Day and talk about what is going on across, uh, across the country today and across the world. So the World Sepsis Day uh, is put on by the Global Sepsis uh, Alliance. And briefly, I have put the um, objectives of the Global Sepsis Alliance there. That includes making sure that there is a voice for both adults and children in all settings, developed and uh, developing worlds, that there is a message that's going out to government, to uh, the public, that we can um, start working on identifying and uh, allocating resources so that people can get the right care at the right time. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's an admirable goal by the Global Sepsis Alliance. One of the ways they are doing this is through World Sepsis Day, which occurs on September 13th every year. This is the second annual World Sepsis Day. And the aim is to increase the awareness of uh, uh, sepsis, and that's both to healthcare professionals as well as to the public. Uh, it is well known there is actually um, a paper that shows that uh, the public's in, uh, understanding of what sepsis is is very poor, uh, and so that needs to, to be increased in terms of awareness of what to look for and when to seek care. Second uh, goal is to celebrate the lives of those people who did die of sepsis uh, and the contribution they made while they were alive. And uh, the third is to promote the World Sepsis uh, Declaration. Uh, and I'll go over that uh, very soon. But uh, a little bit more about World Sepsis Day. There, uh, for this year, there are over 2,300 organizations and hospitals that have committed to supporting World Sepsis Day. And across the globe, there are events happening. I did find a few events that are happening across Canada. Uh, McMaster, there is a symposium, and they say their objective is to catalyze collaboration with research agenda, and uh, they have an event that's being sponsored by CIHR, uh, Institute of Immunity and Infection, and one of the things they're doing is a children's poster contest with the theme of battling bad bacteria and other bugs. I think this is a fantastic way to get the public involved, to get the um, healthcare professionals involved. In BC, they have declared the 150 challenge, and the 150 challenge is, has a goal of saving 150 lives in the next 150 days after World Sepsis Day. Uh, 150 lives of people present with sepsis. Uh, at the Alberta Health Services, we have a, a big day going on. We had a poster. Uh, symposium this morning. We have speakers this afternoon, and then we'll be uh, having a uh, public uh, public event at our TELUS uh, World of Science Center later in the evening. I know there's many more events across the country, um, and it's fantastic to see all of that. World Sepsis, De Sepsis Declaration is just this: by the year 2020, that the incidence of sepsis will be decreased across the globe that survival will be increased for both children and adults in all countries, whether they're developed or developing, and uh, that the recognition systems, such as uh, screening tools and standard emergency treatment, uh, are implemented across the world, that there's an improved understanding and awareness of sepsis by the public as well as professionals, um, that people across the world have access to rehabilitation services, uh, and that um, there is a better way to measure the global burden of sepsis and be able to, um, to make a change to sepsis across the world. I just want to very quickly speak about point number uh, four. Many times when we talk about sepsis, we talk about it in the acute phase. What's happening in the emergency department? What's happening in the ICU? What's happening when they're discharged to the floor? And then they go home. There is a very, very big gap uh, as to how these children, uh, as well as adults, what is going on in their lives after they've been discharged home uh, following an episode of sepsis or severe sepsis. Uh, we really need to get on the ball here and see what kind of um, social uh, and developmental uh, changes happen to some of these children and be able to provide them with some rehabilitation services. I think across Canada that's one area where we can really make a difference. 
So what's happening across the world related to sepsis and sepsis care? This, I think, is a story that many of you will have heard from. It's a Rory Staunton story, who was a young boy in uh, New York. Rory went to school one day and was playing basketball, and uh, he was in phys ed class, he tripped and fell and grazed his knee. And gradually, he started to get feeling more and more pain in his leg. And over time, he started to have a fever and wasn't feeling well. He was seen by his physician who sent him appropriately to the emergency department, who looked at him, investigated him, and after seeing that he had some vomiting and diarrhea and fever, they felt that he had a simple viral infection. He was sent home. Uh, lab work was done, but the results uh, were not back yet when Rory went home. Uh, he went back to his house, and uh, there were several phone calls to healthcare providers because his condition deteriorated. Eventually, he was taken back to the hospital. Unfortunately, uh, Rory's outcome was very poor in the emergency department. He was found to be in severe sepsis and was sent to the ICU, where unfortunately he later died. This became a very high-profile uh, case, and uh, many of you have heard it. It was uh, just occurred last year. As a result of this story, his parents um, have become unbelievable advocates related to improving the recognition of sepsis by healthcare professionals and also the awareness uh, of the public as to what to look for for um, when people are sick. As a result, the state of New York um, has has issued uh, what's called Rory's Regulations. These regulations require hospitals to implement early identification and treatment processes for sepsis. And that includes screening tools at triage for early recognition, and then identifying those patients and treating them uh, quickly through the use of protocols and um, specific guidelines about uh, getting antibiotics uh, into the child as quick as possible. In addition, they have uh, published a Parents' Bill of Rights, and that includes uh, making sure that all results of labs are reported to, from the physicians to the parents, that the parents can ask for more information um, and that they can, they can work through uh, the, the uh, illness episode with their physicians and improve communication. Rory's story has inspired people across the world uh, uh, to the point where there are other places that are uh, considering implementing regulations for the screening and uh, management of sepsis. This brings me to question number four. Given that the state of New York has implemented legislation related to screening and management, do you think there should be legislation in Canada regarding sepsis screening and care plans? Close that now. We'll share those results. So nobody said no, so that's good, uh, I think. 94% uh, said yes, and 6% were unsure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's quite interesting. Um, I'd, I'd be very interested to see how legislation would actually be imposed and what would happen uh, to the healthcare setting if uh, these processes weren't actually met on time or uh, where that went. Um, and so I think it's very interesting to see different people's uh, perspectives on this. Well, what's happening across the world in other places? Um, uh, the Stauntons actually went over to Germany. There was a sepsis uh, conference. Uh, there and um, at that time they announced that there was the creation of a, a national sepsis regulations uh, and uh, Rory's father was actually at the event to make this announcement with the, um, the researchers in Germany. In the United States the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Quality Transformation developed a sepsis committee uh, probably three years back, I think it is now, I've been a part of that committee uh, in terms of developing um, uh, guidelines that can be implemented in pediatric centers uh, across the United States as well as um, uh, adaptation of that to centers that are not specifically pediatric related. I've attached the um, titles of two uh, major uh, 
organizations who have looked at improving care uh, for uh, children with sepsis across the world. Number one is the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. Many of you will have heard of that. And these are updated guidelines in 2008. And then the um, American College of Critical Care Medicine uh, has specific guidelines for uh, pediatric and neonatal septic shock that they have uh, recently published as well. So what's happening in Canada? Well, several years ago, uh, there was actually uh, uh, an effort to improve the care of sepsis in the intensive care units across the country. The Canadian ICU Collaborative um, started in 2003 and has gradually grown. It includes both uh, adult and pediatric sites. And they have looked at, they, bas they choose a, a topic to, uh, to do an improvement uh, initiative around, and that's included ventilator-associated pneumonias, uh, cardiac arrests, line sepsis, end-of-life care, and uh, the one that I got involved in uh, was related to improving mortality from sepsis. And uh, so that was several years ago. As a result, um, several of the ICUs implemented uh, uh, sepsis care pathways uh, for that, um, that initiative. In the world of emergency medicine, the Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians um, published a guideline in the year 2008. This is a fantastic guideline by Dr. Green, uh, and it's used across the country in emergency departments with one significant problem. There is a gap that is very obvious in that it does not include the management of a child in sepsis. Uh, as a result of that, there has been a group of us who have been working on um, Canadian pediatric sepsis guidelines. Uh, we've been working for several years now on that and hopefully in the next little while we will have something out for, for the country to use. Hopefully that will be soon. We've said it for a while but hopefully it will actually come out in the next short time. So I was very curious about what actually was happening in emergency departments across the country and I asked um, several of my colleagues, what do you have in your departments? So this was an informal query to representatives of Pediatric Emergency Research of Canada group. The first question I said was, do you have a department trigger tool or screen for the diagnosis of sepsis? And um, only 4 out of 15 Pediatric Emergency Department sites had a screening tool. Do you have a department guideline? It's a little bit better there. 5 out of 15 sites had a formal guideline or pathway. And when we asked if they had order sets that were specific to pediatric sepsis, again, uh, about a third of sites did have that. When we did this, the survey through CAPSI that I had briefly mentioned before, um, you can see the results here where 64% said that they have management tools, almost 70% have order sets, 36% of those surveyed had clinical screening tools. Uh, this must be taken into light that there was one set, site that uh, responded uh, the most and they did have um, uh, both management and order set and screening tools uh, in their department. So question number five is uh, a free text. Uh, so please feel free to just enter it into the question section on your um, screen. And that question is, what sepsis initiatives, if any, are happening at your site? So just uh, go ahead and uh, type anything in, or any comments or questions, or anything, you know, maybe it's not happening at your site, maybe you're involved through another organization in, um, in something around, um, uh, you know, sepsis screening or sepsis recognition. I know, uh, or you might be involved in CAFC's community of practice in sepsis. But, uh, it doesn't look like anybody's typing anything in, so I'm not sure uh, if we'll just, uh, we'll just leave that open for a bit and uh, as sure. you think of things, put them type them in. And, uh, and I'd be, actually I'd also be interested to know if uh, any of the organizations online uh, represented online if they were doing, if their uh, organizations were doing anything for World Sepsis Day so, or knew what it was. 
So right. I think what you can see from these uh, last few slides is that even though we know there's a good body of evidence to show that we have ways to improve the outcomes of our children with sepsis, uh, while we may be doing those on an individual level, in the emergency department, in the ICU, on the wards, um, out in the communities, uh, on, a, on a more organized perspective, across Canada we need to do some work. Um, definitely when we're seeing results of uh, one quarter to one third of the emergency department, the tertiary emergency departments uh, in Canada, the leaders of the of the country, only one quarter to one third actually have um, organized guidelines for their department. Uh, we we've got a lot of work to do, and that is very exciting because um, we've got a place to start, and we can make a significant difference. And hopefully, that will actually translate into. Uh, to better care and, and our children will definitely benefit from, from those results. So, uh, so Laura, uh, I'm just going to, somebody has um, responded and says, Laura says, we have rolled out a huge sepsis package to staff and a policy is now in place. Um, uh, Laura, I'm not sure where you're from though, if you wouldn't mind just letting us know what organization you're um, representing. Yeah. So while well, well, she's typing that in, uh, Graham, if you just want to. I'll go to. ahead, sure. So when we started off in these um, sepsis work uh, several years ago, we decided to find out what exactly do people want from us? What is the best way that we can actually um, serve the, the, uh, the frontline physicians and the, the community that takes care of our children? We did a, a survey, um, and that survey was distributed to members of the Pediatric Emergency Research of Canada as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics section on emergency medicine. Um, so when I say what do people want, um, by that I mean what do ED physicians want because those are the most important people really, I'm not biased at all. <laughs> Anyways, um, I'm going to show you a few slides of what some of the results were. Uh, importantly, um, look at the overall category. I separated them out into what the different groups had as well. Uh, because we were interested to see if there were differences between Canada and the U.S. so we could actually target what those different um, groups would like. But uh, if you pay attention to the overall category, you'll get a flavor of, of what's important. So one question was, what do you find are the most re important and useful resources in managing children with sepsis? And as you can see, the number one choice, so on a scale of one to five, the number one choice was pathways and protocols. If you recall from my previous slides, showed that uh, oh, uh, not many sites across Canada actually had pathways or protocols. The second most important one was a screening tool, and again, you'll recall most sites did not have that. And the same thing with uh, standardized order sets. So these are all things that people felt were very, very important resources, and yet they just didn't exist um, uh, in Canada. Uh, which gives us a great opportunity, as I said, to, to improve that. The second question we asked here was, what are some of your educational priorities? And um, most people wanted to have guidelines. So this, again, is specific to emergency department, but I think having a national standard that is based out of Canadian practice would be an excellent thing for us to start looking at across the country in whatever discipline we work at. Um, uh, there are certainly guidelines that have been published in the United States, and they are fantastic. Some of the nuances may not be applicable to our healthcare setting, uh, and having it uh, Canadian guidelines would be an excellent opportunity, or even adapting the guidelines that uh, already exist. Um, as you can see, other people thought that review articles would be appropriate to using the use of patient simulation and actually getting um, uh, pre uh, pre-described cases would be a good opportunity as well. And lastly, what are the research priorities? Well, people want clinical markers and biomarkers so that they can identify these children. So where do we go from here? I think um, the community practice is an excellent first opportunity, and my opinion is let's build the, uh, the community. Let's engage those practitioners from all healthcare disciplines. I am an eMERGE doc. Let's get ICU, NICU hospitalists, uh, um, primary care providers, let's talk to the RNs who go into the uh, healthcare centers, let's get people involved, let's get the psychologists to look at outcome after the children go home. 
let's take a look at the people that are outside of the pediatric centers. Yes, we need to focus on our own centers as a CAPC group, but we need to include all the general institutions where more than 80% of children are cared for. Let's identify champions at each of the hospitals and at organizations that take care of children. One of the other things we're doing is expanding that initial Canadian CAIHI data that I presented at the beginning. Uh, there's a look at the 2009 to 2012 data, uh, and Leah is doing a fantastic job for us um, from the CAPC perspective there. We've also started looking at the potential for developing a, a CAPC sepsis screening tool, uh, and I think this is a very important point. In the adult setting, accreditation for adult hospitals now requires a screening tool for sepsis. Those of you who are in hospitals that take care of children, you should expect this to become an element required for accreditation probably within the next year to two years. Finally, we need to look at measures for um, our quality of care in sepsis and develop those standards uh, so we can see if we actually are improving. I'm fortunate to work with Antonio Stan here at Alberta Children's who has started to work on quality metrics at least in the emergency department and sepsis is one of the groups she's looking at. My dream is to have a national database. If we could have a central repository where the care of our children with sepsis went into one place so we could see how we're doing across the country and track that over time and be able to make improvements. That is my dream. My question number six for you is what is your dream for the prevention and management of sepsis in our country's children? Again, if you want to write those questions in the question area, that would be fantastic. I will quickly finish up because we're at the end here. Other short-term dreams I would like to have is getting um, order set templates that people can adapt to their setting. So here is a basic template that we have used um, or we have promoted through CAPC and uh, at whatever hospital you are at, you can adapt it to your setting, whether you're in a pediatric center or a general center. Transfer templates. Again, most of these children or most of our emergency children are seen in centers outside pediatric care centers and then transferred in. We need to be able to give people working in those settings good documentation um, abilities that can prompt them on some of the care they can do. And that's where goals of care, when can I know that my resuscitation has actually improved and uh, I'm doing well or I need to keep working. So our mission today for World Sepsis Day, I hope it's been clear. We need to stop sepsis. We need to implement the, um, the research that's out there. We need to make a change in what we're doing and really uh, take this opportunity to improve the outcomes and to save the lives of our children. I'd just like to thank very quickly um, the people that have helped out with getting, gathering data for me and also those people that are involved in the research uh, that I do related to sepsis. Um, so Kai High and CAPC Group and then Alberta Innovates Health Solutions through the Alberta Sepsis Network have been an invaluable resource for everything that we're doing here in uh, Calgary and across this province and across the country. And that's it. If you um, want to get in touch with me or any more information about World Sepsis Day, the uh, contact is here. Please feel free to do that. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Graham. That was great. Um, we've learned a lot today, I think, a lot to think about and a lot to, to dream about uh, moving forward. So uh, just so that, uh, just to follow up with Laura, Laura is from uh, Health Sciences North in Sudbury, and I actually knew that, and I apologize to Laura. And uh, she says uh, the initiative is called Sepsis, a Bundle of Care, and has been placed uh, on our internet for staff to complete. And we have another comment from Chris, uh, from Chris Thibault. All British Columbia Children's Hospital, oh, at, sorry, I'm having trouble reading here. At British Columbia Children's Hospital, we have a screening tool, clinical management guidelines, including uh, immediate management, zero to 60 minutes and one to six hours. In addition, an algorithm for antibiotic treatment and standard order sets. In support of World Sepsis Day, the Critical Care Program has hosted two doc talks about sepsis management and anti uh, antibiotic talk by our clinical pharmacist. We included a clinical sepsis uh, simulation and a sepsis quiz for staff. That sounds great, Chris. You're, I know you uh, at um, 
BC Children's, there's been a, a, a lot of work uh, going on, and you implemented your sepsis bundle, I believe, uh, a, a while back. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, how things are there moving forward, and after you know after, how things improve over over time. And uh, we heard a little bit of data from um, Deb Scott there earlier this year. And it would be interesting to, to hear in another six or eight months the, the changes and uh, how you've been able to sustain that program. So again, I encourage uh, everybody to uh, write their questions in into the uh, control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, you can type in your questions or your comments. And also just a reminder that um, this is uh, recorded, this presentation is recorded and we'll put it up on the Knowledge Exchange Network and you can share this with your colleagues to view at, a diff uh, you know, at another time what's more convenient for them. And I um, don't know, um, as part of uh, our CASI community of practice, uh, again, you know, Graham uh, brought up all the points that I think are really important to us is sort of this um, national collaborative effort to create standards and uh, to work together and uh, come up with a consensus on what we think, you know, to begin with, uh, for, for screening across the country and how we can uh, implement uh, a screening tool that will work uh, at all levels of care so that uh, that nobody's missed and um, the whole uh, idea around having your your giant database where we can actually measure and we actually know what's uh, going on and we can compare and see how well we're doing um, as part of the Canadian Pediatric Decision Support Network I don't know if that's something uh, in future that um, that Cassie's um, benchmarking group can look at and look at different indicators that can be measured and, and shared. So I think that there's a lot to think about and uh, a, a lot that we can do moving forward. So I don't uh, have any questions for you, Graham. I guess, you, uh, I guess you've uh, covered it all. So uh, if I have a question. Oh, do you have a question? I have a question. <laughs> Leah has a question. Uh, Graham, that was awesome. I'm, I'm just wondering along the lines of building that national registry, whether you have some thoughts on, on what particular data elements in it, not to get into the minutiae, minutia, but I, I'm curious because I know we have uh, recently started working with Kai Hai through the submission of uh, information through the DAD and NACRS abstract to collect uh, pediatric surgical wait times. So there's opportunities sometimes to look at special project fields, even as sort of as a test pilot. But what sort of, I guess I'm trying to figure out the, the depth and breadth of, of what that may look like. And I, I would be interested in, in hearing more about your thoughts on, on what, what that would look like. Um, I think the, the first thing then that uh, we need to do is get um, all players on the table. So I can specifically tell you what I would like from the emergency department. I know that um, the ICU and other uh, settings would really like to be able to have some input as well. Um, my The big things that I know that actually make a difference in sepsis is getting fluids in and getting antibiotics in and doing it quickly and then getting the children to their appropriate level of care. So um, the, we've, we actually had um, sepsis research in terms of, of outcomes is very, very hard in children. In adults, it's easier because you report on changes to mortality because their mortality is 30 to 40%. Our mortality overall is approximately 5%, and when you take ICU, it might sneak up to 9 10%. And so any changes um, are, are quite small, and, and the number of times you can actually do that uh, in a single center is very, very difficult, and that's what the benefit of having a national registry would be, is that you could have it on a, a more global scale. Um, so uh, we have to get everybody on the table to see where things are going. We have to do some um, identification of what good markers are. One of the other troubles we had with some of of, of this evaluating our implementation of our, our project was um, 
we want to know things like how many pill people received their fluids within a certain number of minutes from the the um, the, in, the initiation or uh, recognition of sepsis. Well, how do you know when sepsis was recognized? What is your time zero? Most of these outcomes are um, <clears throat> saying that we do better if we quickly give fluids and quickly give antibiotics. And to measure if we're improving is very difficult because what is time zero? Is it triage? Is it when you recognize sepsis and how do you tell when sepsis was recognized? It becomes very tricky. Mm. I, I would love to see some data on time to first fluids, time to antibiotics, amount of fluid that a child received, um, who went to ICU, things like ventilator days, uh, things like days on inotrope medications, um, length of stay. Those are all reasonable things to target. Um, I would love to chat with uh, Antonia a little bit more on her um, quality indicators project and see uh, where she thinks we need to go um, from a clinical perspective. And then maybe some of the administrators who are online can tell us from their perspective what may be good outcomes to start looking at uh, as well. Yeah. Excellent points. Well, uh, thanks, Leah. And, um, um, I, do you have something else? I'm to just say? wondering to to those online. I mean, there was quite a, a substantial number that said that they used order sets. I believe. Not, I don't remember if it was electronic or not. I'm wondering if anybody in the group is actually doing any analysis based on those order sets in terms of outcomes. But everybody's muted. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Some food for thought there. Yeah, it's just something to think about. Yeah. So uh, we don't have any more questions uh, at this time. So maybe uh, they yeah. can write into yeah. the site. Yeah, uh, if anybody has any, any further questions or comments for us, questions for Graham, you can uh, either get a hold of Graham at his contact information up on the screen or please feel free to get a hold of me and I can also give you more information on CAFC's community of practice and sepsis and uh, just to let you know that we are having a workshop uh, to further some of this work uh, after the CAFC conference in uh, Toronto so October 23rd uh, we're having a workshop so if you need any more information on any of the, any of the work that we're doing uh, please let me know and uh, thank you so much, Graham, and thank you everybody for uh, taking some time this Friday afternoon to spend with us.